he had this little cabin in the bush, and we would go there. And when I was about 17 years old, my dad gave me my mother's car to take my buddy skiing for the weekend without any parental supervision. What parent does that? Do you have any idea how dumb a 17-year-old boy is? Do you know? Do you have any idea? So teenagers are the worst people. Don't ever be a teenager, I'm telling you. <laughs> Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. So today I am carrying on in the series that began a few weeks ago called Grace Revisited. And I've pointed this out. That for the most part, we have a, a, a sort of a rudimentary understanding of grace, a bit superficial, frankly. It's unmerited favor, and that does not do grace justice. And we've been trying to look at it and trying to break it apart and see it in a much greater and a much more expansive way. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping you're growing and learning about it. And uh, I'm going to go back to where I always begin this thing, and it's how you spell grace. G-R-A-C-E, and remind me what that spells. God's riches at Christ's expense. I really want you to get that, because if you can remember that word, you can remember a lot about this. But we're going to be talking about this thing called grace, because grace is when God gives us so much more than we deserve. And that's what this concept's about. Now, today's going to be a little bit more theological. It's actually impossible to talk about grace without getting into it a little bit deeper. And I'm always a little worried when I do that. And so here's the deal I'm going to make with you. If I, if I start to get in the weeds this morning, you just shout out at any time you want, boring, <laughs> and, and I'll know where we're going. Nobody shouted at so far, so, so, so far, so good. Last night, someone shouted at it immediately. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to jump into the book of Romans, and uh, we're going to look at this passage, probably familiar to you, but you need to kind of work through it slowly to really get a sense of what it's all about. And so we're going to start in Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Listen to this. The first part's easy. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So who was the one man who was disobedient? Who knows? Yes, that would have been Adam. Who was the one man that was obedient that made us all righteous? Jesus. And that would be Jesus, his obedience to going to the cross. So, so far, so good. Not very hard to figure out. The next verse, verse gets a little trickier. Verse 20 says this. Moreover, the law entered that the offense may, might abound. The law entered that the offense might abound. So here we are. We're all, we all have a sin nature. We inherited from Adam and Eve. And Paul says... That the, the purpose of the law, it entered actually so that the offense may abound. Now, now, what law is he talking about? He's talking about, specifically, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the moral law of God. And here, here's, you know, the Mosaic law, as we often call it. Here's the thing it's hard to understand, is that the law didn't come to fix our sin nature. We sometimes think it did. Paul says, actually, it was ineffective because of the weakness of the flesh. Guess what? We couldn't actually keep the law. So it wasn't that we weren't sinners, but we didn't know we were sinners. And so the law came that the offense might abound so that we would know that we were breaking it. Are you following this? That's the purpose of it. It's just to reveal the fact that we are sinners. And I want you to think about this just sort of in a civic nature. Laws, as they are, human laws, whatever they are, don't actually make us better people. Do laws make you better people? No, they might make you more compliant because you are obliged to, you keep them. But do they actually change you? Do they make you better people? The answer to that is no. There's 80,000 laws in Canada from coast to coast in every jurisdiction. I know three of them. I mean, who knows? Who even knows what laws we're breaking? We don't even know. And because you don't know what laws you're breaking, you don't think you're breaking laws, right? You get it? So the law comes to change that. So I was thinking about something yesterday. You're going to get a kick out of this, I think. So I'm sitting there. I have this front room, and I'm, I'm right in the corner, and I can see the stop sign right on my corner. And I noticed something yesterday I was, as I was sitting there that nobody stops at that stop sign. Nobody. I mean, it's a very quiet neighborhood. Everybody does a rolling stop. They all just slow down, and they roll through there again and again. And so I started getting a little indignant, and I was thinking to myself, why is nobody stopping at that stop sign? We have laws in this society. And then something dawned on me. I have never once stopped at that stop sign. 
I, I have lived there for 35 years, and I've never stopped at that stop sign. Now, if there's somebody coming or a child, I might stop. But, but you know, I'm one of these guys. You know how some of you have that little Christian fish on your, on your bumper? I got a bumper sticker that says, if you don't like my driving, get off of the sidewalk, right? So, so I, I don't want anyone to know I'm a Christian, especially now that, you know, I go through this, this stop sign. I thought, why do, why do I do that? And I think, I don't think it applies to me because... It's my corner. It's my stop sign. <laughs> That's the way I look. Look at this thing. And I started thinking about, this is terrible. Why don't I keep that law? And, you know, here's the, here's the thing. Has that stop sign made me a better person? Apparently not. Has it made me a better driver? Apparently not. Then what is it for? I'll tell you what it's for. If and when the day comes there's a cop sitting on that corner and I get pulled over and I get a violation for going through that stop sign, will I have a defense? No, I will not have a defense. And you see, because I'll know I'm guilty, and see, that's what the law did. The law was brought into place. I mean, it was righteous. The law was righteous. Don't misunderstand me. All those things are good things. But he knew he couldn't keep them, but he had to let us know you're a pathetic sinner. And so he brought the law in so that we would recognize that. Are we following this so far? Okay, so, so here's, where we, here's where we go from this. Verse 21. But where sin abounded, like we just talked about, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And he says that he brought the law. See, this, this passage, these three verses, actually explains the whole gospel. That Adam, the, the first man, he transgressed. We all became sinners. The law came to remind us and to reveal that we were sinners. And then Jesus came to die on the cross so that he might extend grace to us to be able to save us from that situation. That's the, that's the whole gospel right there in a nutshell. And so then the big curveball is the next verse. And the next verse here, and this is sort of where we're going to land, is, is Romans chapter 6. Verse 1, it says this. It's in a different chapter, but it's still talking about the same thing. And he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? I mean, why, why would he have to say this? Why would he have to say, well, what's the result then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because he said, where the sin abounds, grace abounds more. And why would he have to say it? Because people actually think it. That's why. And we are living in a world... To, see, it existed 2,000 years ago. People actually believed this. They said, oh, grace of God is great. We can, we can just do whatever we want now because where sin abounds, grace abounds, which is true. But Paul reminds us, certainly not. It means you are dead to sin. It means you have been forgiven of your sin. It doesn't mean that you can carry on in it indefinitely. So here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to... I'm going to give you a little illustration I sometimes use, and I call it the two ditches, the two ditches of grace. And I'm going to use the word liberty in this, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it's maybe a little confusing, and I told you that, but, but here, here we go. The book of Galatians, if you ever want to do a deep dive into grace, you go to the book of Galatians. I mean, Paul is a champion of grace. 80% uh, of all references to grace were Paul's. And the book of Galatians is just grace, 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 all the way through it, how, we, how it works and how we live in it and what we should do with it. And that's where you go for a deep dive. And we, we don't have time for that, but if you're really, really interested, go read the, the book of Galatians. And so one of the things that he does there is he equates grace with the word liberty. And you'll see him connecting it all the way through. He talks about stand fast in the liberty in which Christ has set you free and no longer be entangled in a yoke of bondage. And this thing about liberty or freedom is so absolutely intrinsic to who we are as humans. And when you ask people, what is, what is mankind's greatest human desire? They'll often incorrectly answer happiness. And that's actually not true. Freedom is a far greater desire for people. Freedom is what people really long for. That's what their heart cries out for. And they will put up with all kinds of hardship and all kinds of adversity, and they'll put up with poverty and sickness and all kinds of things as long as they can be free. And when William Wallace, Braveheart, was lying on that slab and they were slaying him alive, he didn't cry out, happiness! That was not his moment. What did he cry out? He cried out, freedom! 
Because that is the cry and the long of our heart. And so Paul goes through the book of Galatians, and he talks about how this amazing concept of grace gives us the thing we all long for, liberty. But we're not always clear on what liberty means, because liberty doesn't mean to do whatever the heck you want. That's not what it means. So I'm going to show you the two ditches. Here it is. I'm going to throw it up. I've, I've set it up for you. So liberty is this highway. It's this road. And, and, and in grace, we find liberty. But there's a ditch on either side, a, a desperate ditch on either side. And on one side, it's legalism. And on the other side, it is license. And here's how I describe it. I'll throw it up on the screen so you, you can get it really clear in your head. So here's how I describe it. Liberty is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. Legalism is the law without grace, and license is the grace without law. So I want to start with this. I, I want to spend a couple of moments, and then I'll come back to it, about what liberty really is. Liberty is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. And how do we walk in liberty? We, we, we don't do whatever we want, nor do we have to necessarily walk in the, in the law verbatim. But what we do is we are led by the Spirit. And here's how Paul puts it. He says, for as many are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. And if you will walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the, the, the key to grace is having a personal relationship with the living God who came and bestowed this wonderful thing called grace on us. And then he gave us the Holy Spirit to be able to walk in it. So I want to tell you how we stay on the road and not go into one of these ditches. And then I'll go into what these ditches are. I'm going to tell you a story about this. You know how I have these personal stories that fit everything perfectly? How is that possible? I don't know. So, so, when I, so I, I've been a skier my whole life, big skier, love skiing even to this day. I started when I was 10 years old, and, and my dad was a skier. He loved skiing, and he uh, built this little ski lodge uh, near McCreary, Manitoba. How many of you know where McCreary, Manitoba is? And there used to be a ski hill there called Agassiz. Some of you remember that? And Agassiz's gone, but McCreary's still there, and we had this little cabin in the bush, and we would go there. And when I was about 17 years old, my dad gave me my mother's car to take my buddy skiing for the weekend without any parental supervision. What parent does that? <laughs> Do you have any idea how dumb a 17-year-old boy is? Do you know? Do you have any idea? So teenagers are the worst people. Don't ever be a teenager, I'm telling you. <laughs> so anyway, so my mom's sitting over there. Uh, he gave me her 1966 Pontiac Prezian station wagon. It's the biggest car that was ever made. It's approximately the size of this stage, and it was the same color. <laughs> so I piled all my friends in, and off we went, the three-hour trip, and we went skiing on the Saturday, and on Saturday night, we were staying there. Now, we're 17, so we're too young to go out drinking and get drunk, so that was the good news. The bad news is we decided we were going to go to a movie in McCreary, which was five miles away, and it was a snowstorm. So we got out of the bush, which was fine. It was just snowing, but as soon as we got out of the bush onto the highway, the wind was blowing, and it was zero visibility. When I say zero, you couldn't see the bumper on the front of the car. And so most people, normal people, intelligent people, <laughs> would have turned around and gotten back. But I was 17. Did I mention that to you? <laughs> and not very bright then, still not terribly bright today. But nevertheless, we said, I think we can make it. It was five miles in zero visibility. So Bud, my friend, he put on his ski goggles, rolled down the window, and he stuck his head out the window. <laughs> and he said, here's how we'll do it. I'll say veer to the left or veer to the right if you're going off the road. I could not see the road. I was driving, driving blindly into a snowstorm with Bud, who was less bright than I was, <laughs> hanging out the window going, veer to the left. Veer to the right. <laughs> and so anyway, he was yelling, veer to the left. And I thought, no, I think he's wrong. I think I can see. And he started yelling louder. Veer. Now it's blowing and windy and the window's open. I can't really hear him. But he's yelling, veer to the left. And I thought, I don't think he's right. I think that's the road in front of me. Guess what? It wasn't the road, it was the ditch. And I drove that big old Pontiac right into the ditch and buried it into the snow. Now, the good news is we were only 100 feet from the road. <laughs> we had not come, maybe 100 yards, not very far. So we left the car there for the night. We went the next day, we had to call a tow truck. And we had to have it hauled, and they had to dry it out because it was full of snow from the storm. Ruined the whole day, cost us a ton of money. 
It was just like the absolute dumbest mistake. And I've always thought about that because of this. The only voice that could have kept me out of the ditch, I ignored to do things and navigate on my own accord. Are you following this? And the only voice that will keep you out of the ditch in life is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And if you're going to walk in grace, he says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You're not going to end up in the ditch. So let's talk about these two ditches for a moment. The first ditch is, is legalism. And, and legalism is the law without grace. And here, here's what the scripture says about this in the book of Galatians. It says, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, like I just talked about, you are now being made perfect in the flesh? He says, who has bewitched you? Who told you that somehow you could go back to the law, and you could go back to the rules, and you could ba go back to this? And so when I'm talking about going back to the flesh, I'm talking about instead of being changed from the inside out, we try to change ourselves from the outside out. And I bet you there are people in this church, please don't put, raise your hand, that were, grew up in a church that was preoccupied with the externals, the things on the outside. And do this and do that and do this and do that. And there was very little regard to what was on the inside. And Jesus' harshest criticism was saved for who? The Pharisees. He said, you are whitewashed sepulchers. You're white on the outside and you're dead on the inside. He said, you wash the outside of the cup, but the inside of the cup is full of greed and self-indulgence. And he had absolutely contempt for these people because they were all about the appearance on the outside. And it had nothing to do with what was on the inside. And the church, often throughout the 2,000 years of church history, has veered into that ditch. They have veered into that and have become legalistic and have become to the point where they have put all these rules and this preoccupation on the externals. You know, those churches where they say, you know, don't smoke and drink and chew and go with girls who do. Those kind of churches, right? It's all about the externals. You know, I love it. People ask me this question. I love getting asked this question, so I'll answer it for everybody. They say, Pastor Mark, will I go to hell for smoking? And of course the answer is no, but you'll smell like you've already been there, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I'll spend any more time on that ditch. I think you all have a bit of an idea. Let's talk about the ditch on the other side of the road. And the ditch on the other side of the road is license, and it is, it is grace without law. And you know what I call it? A license to sin. Remember James Bond had a license to kill? And we have Christians who think they have a license to sin. Why else would they say, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Why would they say that? if they didn't actually think that anything would go. And here's what it says in Galatians. Again, it's all in Galatians. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Did you catch that? In the book of Jude, he refers to it as license or licentiousness, using grace as a pretext for licentiousness, license, or license to do whatever. And, and so here's, here's the understanding of this. And, and I'll tell you, it's even got a name theologically. Uh, it, it's been dubbed recent, I guess more recently. It, it's called hyper, uh, hyper grace. How many of you heard of the hyper grace movement? Any of you, a few of you have heard of it. Um, it. It's actually more common than you think in North American culture today. I could name churches that are hyper grace churches and pastors who are hyper grace pastors, and you'd recognize these names. But nevertheless, here, here's, here's what's behind it. So the first belief, and, and it's correct, is this, is that Jesus died for all of your sin, past, present, and future. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's absolutely true. But here's where they get hung up. That if Jesus died for my sins in the future, then it doesn't matter what I do or don't do because I can't do anything to gain the favor of God and I'm already forgiven, so why do I need to worry about it? Now, they don't come out and say it is in as blunt a terms as I just said, but in fact, that's what they are saying. And when you look at hyper-grace churches and hyper-grace pastors, you will find that they have a very high disregard for this concept of, of, of right and wrong. So I, I want to share a story with you. I had a personal encounter with one of these pastors. I didn't know that's where he was coming from. We actually had him, it was quite a few years ago, so you, you probably didn't hear him, but, but we, we brought him into the city. He preached in our church, and that night he was staying at our house. And so we're having dinner. Kathy's bringing out, brings out this dinner. And he asks this question. He says, are we going to have wine with dinner? 
And uh, Kathy said, no. And, I, and let me just explain something if you don't know. Uh, we're non-drinkers. We've never had alcohol in our house. We've been married 42 years. We've never had alcohol, never even in the house. Never had it, never had a drink. We don't drink. I don't drink. Kathy doesn't drink. Our kids don't drink. Uh, I don't necessarily impose this on others, well, maybe with the exception of our staff, but, but I'll, I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why I, I don't drink, and, and it's, it's because of this. My father was an alcoholic, my grandfather was an alcoholic. I remember when we got married, I looked at that and I thought, I don't see any good coming out of that. I don't see any value and any virtue whatsoever in this. And so we just made it a decision, we were gonna be a dry home, we are gonna live that way, and if people didn't like it, it was their, it was their problem. So, so that was our, our standard on this. So anyway, he asks us if, if we we're, were going to have wine with dinner, and Kathy says, no. And uh, so then he said, why, why don't you drink wine? And so I told him why we didn't drink wine. I said, I don't, I don't impose this on other people. He says, do you think drinking wine is a sin? And I said, I'm pretty sure that drink, Jesus drank a a glass of wine once in a while, because that's what they would have had. They didn't have refrigeration. Pretty sure they didn't have Welch's grape root juice, you know. And so I said, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a sin. But I said, for me, it is a sin. And for me, it is in, in this broken world that has abused this so terribly. For me, it's just not something I'm going to do. So I thought that conversation was fine. I don't care what he does. But then he said this. He said, so where do you stand on smoking pot? I said, what do you think? <laughs> if a guy doesn't drink, there's a good chance he's not going to be smoking pot. And so I said, why would you even ask that question? And he said, well, because I don't think there's wrong, anything wrong with having a drink. And he says, nor do I think there's anything wrong with smoking a joint. And then he told me, you will not believe this. He, then he told me that in his church, he was the, the worship director as well. And he says, oftentimes on Sunday morning, just before the service would start, they would go out in the back and they would share a joint together. I said, you're kidding me, right? He said, no, I'm not kidding. And it says it really loosens this up. Well, Kathy got so mad, she wanted to kick him out. She said, I don't want this man staying in our house. I said, Kathy, that's not grace. <laughs> <laughs> we're letting this loser uh, sleep in our house tonight, and we're kicking him out tomorrow. <laughs> that's, that's how we're going to handle this. And so here's how you identify. There's two things that really identify a hyper-grace church. And the first one is this, they have a disregard for the Ten Commandments. They actually don't talk about them. And, and here's what they'll say. They'll say, grace abolished the Ten Commandments, abolished the law. Is that true? No. It's not true. What did Jesus say? How many of you remember what Jesus said? He said, I did not, I did not come to abolish the law, but to what? To fulfill it. It's such a ridiculous statement. Now, here's what I always ask people. I say, okay, so the Old Testament law has been abolished. Which one of the Ten Commandments is no longer valid? The murder one? Or is, is that no longer in, in effect? How about the adultery one? How about the, the, the stealing one? How about the coveting your neighbor's thing? Which one of these Ten Commandments is not valid? It's such a ridiculous concept, isn't it? And that's why Abraham Lincoln said this. He held up the Bible one day and he said, this book is the greatest gift that God has given to man, for without it we would not know right from wrong. And I think that's absolutely true. How are you going to know right from wrong? So the law is not unrighteous people, but we need grace with the law. Now there's the second thing, I'll tell you what it is. The second thing about the, the symptom of a hyper-grace church is this, is they do not use the word sin or repentance, almost never. And I'm not going to mention the name, but I'll, I'll tell you the story. The pastor of the largest church in North America has been asked repeatedly this question, how come you don't use the word sin? Which he doesn't. He said, I don't use that word. And he said, here's why. He says, because I think people know when they're doing wrong. Now, I have a question for you. Is that true? Do people know when they're doing wrong? And the fact of the matter is, you have churches where they don't use the word sin and they don't talk about repentance. I'm telling you, you have people who think that they will continue in sin, that grace may abound. It's like the, this, this, this woman, she's pretty upset. She goes to her priest and she's in the confessional. She says, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And the priest says, well, what have you done? She says, I think I might be committing the sin of vanity. He says, why do you think that? She says, every morning I go and I look in the mirror and I say, you are the most beautiful woman in the world. To which the pa pa priest said, oh, that's not a sin. That's an error in judgment. 
<laughs> I'm really sorry for telling that joke. <laughs> but it was so funny. <laughs> so I had. So the first, the first ditch, of course, is, is legalism, which is the law without grace. And the other ditch is, is license, which is the grace without law. And the middle road, the, the liberty road, is simply this. It is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. So let me wrap the whole thing up w with one final story. So uh, there was this missionary, his name was Ludwig Namason, and uh, he ended up going to Sumatra, which is one of the Indonesian islands, uh, specifically to a people called Batak. Now, I don't know a lot about Sumatra. I like their coffee. I like it better than Colombian. That's all I know about Sumatra. But the first Western person to discover that particular region was Marco Polo. And Marco Polo said the Batak people, he reported back that the Batak people were cannibals, right? I don't actually know, I don't think that was actually true, but when you get a reputation of being cannibals, that's sort of what happens, right? You, you've heard the stories, right? Two cannibals are, are, are eating a clown. The one cannibal turns to the other and says, does this taste funny to you? Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not my favorite joke. My favorite joke is, you're going to hate this one. Wait for this one. The two cannibals are have, having lunch. Uh, the one says to the other, your wife makes delicious soup. He says, yeah, I know, but I'm really going to miss her. <laughs> <laughs> I told you you weren't going to like it. So Marco Polo reports, sorry about that. So Marco Polo <laughs> reports back that the Batek people are, are cannibals, and so you don't want to go near them. So Ludwig Nomensen takes that as a challenge. You know how some people are like that? That's who I want to go share the gospel with. So he goes, turns out they aren't cannibals. And they actually receive him into the community and whatever. And for, for many months he was, he was preaching, he'd learned the language and he was preaching the gospel and he was working with the community. And finally the chief came to him and said, you know, I think you need to go. You've been here this whole time and I don't see any difference between your religion and our religion. Our religion, our beliefs is that you shouldn't murder and you shouldn't kill and you shouldn't take another man's wife. So I don't really see how your rules are any different than ours. So this is what Newman said to the chief. He said, the difference between your religion and my religion is my God empowers people to keep the law. So he said, okay, I'll give you a challenge. I'll give you six months. And if you can prove that to me in six months, then I'll let you stay, and if you can't, then we're going to eat you. No, that's not what he said. He said, then, then we're going to ask you to leave. And so anyway, for the next six months, he started to preach the gospel. He invited people, and people started to come. They listened. They were intrigued. After six months, he had led 2,000 people to Christ, and they were noticeably living differently, so much so that the chief came to him and said, you are right. I'm going to give you freedom and tell our people they are welcome to accept Christ your religion if they would like to. By the time his life was over, you ready for this? He led 180,000 people in the Batak region to Christ. That's a remarkable story. Because Christianity, and grace in particular, is not the freedom from, uh, it's the freedom from sin, not the freedom to sin. They were so enthralled, if you go to that region, like I said, I've never been there, you see statues of Namensen everywhere, in front of churches and buildings, and there's memorials to them, and there's one there in, in gold in front of this, I think it's a church, I don't know what it is, and in every single one of these, these statues that's fascinating to me, he's always got a Bible in his hand. You see, that is the power of grace. Grace is the road to liberty, the freedom from sin, not the freedom to sin. Stand fast in this liberty in which Christ has made you free. There is nothing more powerful than grace. And grace can give you the very thing that our heart cries out for, to be free. And because he who the sun sets free is free indeed, and nothing will make you freer than this wonderful thing called grace. Let's stand together. If you'd like a booklet to help you understand more about God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ, please contact us and we'd be happy to send you a free copy of the Book of Hope. Visit our website at www.churchoftherock.ca Thank you for watching and God bless you.